Welcome back to A Crash Investigation, the podcast, the show where we dissect and discuss prominent crashes in aviation history. I'm your host, Kai, and in today's episode, we'll be going back to our very first episode. We'll be discussing the Tenerife collision disaster. So I hope you're ready for this. Let us jump in. So this tragedy happened on the 27th of March 1977. The airport where the flights were taking off from was Los Rodeos Airport in Reef, the Canary Islands in Spain. As you know, there were two aircrafts involved in this tragedy. So we're going to start with KLM Flight 4805. The origin of this flight was Amsterdam Airport in the Netherlands. Its destination was Grand Canaria Airport in the Canary Islands. And there were 234 passengers and 14 crew members. The aeroplane used was a Boeing 747. The second aeroplane was the Pan American Flight 1736, aka Clipper 1736. This one originated from Los Angeles International Airport in California, the United States of America. The stopover was JFK International Airport in New York, the United States of America, and its destination was Grand Canaria Airport, the Canary Islands. It had 380 passengers and 16 crew members. The KLM captain Jacob Louis Feldhazen van Sampton played a significant role in the tragic accident that occurred. In order to gain a comprehensive understanding of the factors that may have contributed to the incident, it is important to examine various aspects of his professional and personal life, including his flying experience, training, health and state at the time of the accident. Captain Veldhazen van Santen had extensive flying experience, accumulating a total of 11,700 flight hours. Within this total, he had spent 1,545 hours specifically on the Boeing 747. This indicates substantial familiarity with the aircraft, having an average of approximately 250 hours per year since his qualification in 1971. It is crucial to acknowledge that part of his flight time was dedicated to training flights, which are generally less demanding and present fewer operational challenges compared to regular line flights. Furthermore, the captain had a background as a flight instructor on the Boeing 747, as well as the DC-9, highlighting his experience and capability in instructing other pilots. It is notable that he had conducted the co-pilot's qualification check only two months prior to the accident. At the time of the accident, Captain Veldhazen van Santen was reported to be in good health. Medical examinations conducted by the company doctor confirmed that he had no current medical issues and his hearing and vision were normal for someone of his age. The captain did not require glasses for visual correction. To further affirm his fitness to fly, his most recent airman's medical examination conducted on the 2nd of December 1976 showed no waivers or concerns. Now he stayed before the flight took place. Captain Veldhazen van Santen reported for duty at quarter to 8 a.m. GMT and he had been on duty for approximately 9 hours and 21 minutes when the accident occurred. Unfortunately, the exact duration of rest he received the previous night is unknown, leaving a critical information gap. Additionally, no details regarding his activities or food consumption prior to the flight are available. Now let's move on to the first officer. Born on February 14, 1945, Klaus Mills had obtained a total of 9,200 flight hours at the time of the accident. He possessed an extensive aviation experience that undoubtedly contributed to his position as a first officer for KLM. Although specific details regarding his career trajectory are unknown, his experience was not limited to any one particular aircraft. However, his most recent accumulation of flight hours was primarily on the Boeing 747, with 95 hours logged in since his check by Captain Van Sarten on January 17, 1977. 
According to records, First Officer Mears underwent his most recent airman's medical examination on the 2nd of December 1976. Unfortunately, the details surrounding the outcome of this examination were not disclosed, hindering a comprehensive understanding of his physical condition. Nonetheless, it is reasonable to assume that KLM followed proper protocols and ensured his medical fitness to undertake his duties as a first officer. Specific details regarding his activities leading up to the day of the accident, including his previous night's activities, meal consumption and sleep remain unknown. Consequently, it is equally uncertain what he ate or drank during the day of the accident. Though unfortunate, this lack of information prevents a more accurate assessment of his condition during the flight, but we can assume that he was healthy enough to continue with this flight. First Officer Mears reported for duty at the same time as Captain Van Santen, indicating a synchrony of their schedules and preparations for the flight. As a First Officer, Mears played a vital role in supporting the captain's decisions and execution of flight protocols. Their partnership and communication were critical factors in the successful and safe operation of the aircraft. Willem Schrauder, the flight engineer on the KLM flight, was an experienced and highly regarded professional in the aviation industry at the age of 48 with a birth date of august 30th 1928 he brought with him a wealth of experience garnered from his 15,210 flight hours Sharada had been serving as a flight engineer on the boeing 747 aircraft for approximately one year accumulating a total of 540 hours on this particular model apart from his role as a flight engineer Sharada was also a private pilot and an active member of the flight engineers aero club while Sharada's dedication to his profession is unquestionable, it is important to also note his resistance to the integration of flight engineering functions with those of the pilot crew members, which is a red flag already. According to a close friend of his, Sharada believed that the role of a flight engineer should solely focus on power plant and system analysis and maintenance considerations. He was apprehensive about incorporating tasks such as communications, navigation, and general monitoring of flight operations into the flight engineer's responsibilities. This viewpoint highlighted his belief in the importance of specialization and expertise within each role. Described as having a quote-unquote very positive personality, Schrader was known for expressing his opinions freely. This attribute was evident during the events leading up to the Flight. Despite having an influential position as a flight engineer, Schrader maintained strong opinions about the distinctiveness of his role and responsibilities within the aviation industry. Schrader's prominence extended beyond his daily duties. He was a key figure in establishing the European Flight Engineers Organization and held the position of its first president at the time of the accident. This demonstrated his active involvement in shaping the industry and advocating for the role of flight engineers. In terms of Schrauder's health and wellness prior to the accident, the information available is limited. His most recent airman's medical examination occurred on August 16, 1976, indicating that he had met the necessary requirements to carry out his duties. However, specific details about but previous night's activities, meal consumption, and sleep schedule are unknown. Likewise, there are no information regarding his food and beverage intake on the day of the accident. Now let's move on to the Pan Am Captain Victor Graves was an experienced pilot who had accumulated an impressive 21,043 hours of total flying time, including 564 hours specifically on the Boeing 747 aircraft. His last medical examination had been conducted on the 23rd of March 1977, and his most recent proficiency check was carried out on November 15, 1976. These details suggest that Captain Graves possessed the necessary qualifications and medical clearance to operate the aircraft safely. Before the flight, Captain Graves had reportedly taken a nap in the afternoon or evening, ensuring that he was well rested. After waking up, he had a normal dinner. Furthermore, he reported at the airport approximately an hour before the scheduled takeoff time. These preparations indicated that Captain Graves had taken the necessary steps to ensure his physical and mental well-being for the flight. Due to a late arrival of their aircraft from Los Angeles, the Pan Am flight was delayed by an hour. During this time, Captain Graves had a snack. 
However, he later stated that he did not recall eating during the flight or whilst they were on the Grand Tenerife. While it is understandable that a delay in unexpected circumstances can be stressful for a pilot, Captain Grab's conduct throughout the flight remains a subject of scrutiny. Although he had taken a nap and had a normal dinner, it is crucial to investigate whether he exhibited any signs of fatigue, stress or distraction during the extended flight duration. Personal well-being, especially regarding food intake and emotional state, can significantly impact the pilot's ability to make sound decisions under challenging circumstances, which is something that we are going to talk about later on. Robert Bragg, the first officer on the Pan Am aircraft, was an experienced and senior aviation professional. However, despite his expertise, a lack of information regarding his previous night's activities, meal consumption and sleep, as well as his diet on the day of the accident, leaves many unanswered questions about his potential state of mind and physical condition. Regardless, Robert Bragg, born on September 14, 1937, had accumulated an impressive 10,800 hours of total flying time, a clear indication of his extensive experience in the aviation industry. Out of all these hours, he has specifically flown on the Boeing 747 aircraft for 2,796 hours, demonstrating his familiarity with the specific type of aircraft involved in this incident. This level of experience and expertise held by Bragg attests to his capabilities as a first officer. On January 13, 1977, Bragg underwent his last medical examination, which should have confirmed his fitness to fly. However, it is unknown whether any health conditions were identified during this examination as such information is not available. Furthermore, his most recent proficiency check took place on January 17, 1977. This indicates that he was up to date with the necessary training and had demonstrated his proficiency in adhering to aviation protocols and procedures. Unfortunately, the lack of information about the first officer's previous night's activities, meal consumption and sleep significantly hampers our understanding of his potential physical and mental condition at the time of the accident. Now let's move on to the flight engineer. Flight engineer George Warnes, born on December 12, 1930, was an experienced professional who had amassed an impressive 15,000 210 hours of total flying time, with 559 hours of experience specifically on the Boeing 747 aircraft, once was undoubtedly well versed in his role as a flight engineer for Pan Am. As a crucial member of the flight crew, his knowledge and expertise were dependent upon to ensure the smooth execution and safety of the flight. Alright, so both aircraft's final destination was Grand Canaria Airport, but this stop, which is Los Rodeos Airport, wasn't scheduled. We will discuss that later. So with KLM Flight 4805, the flight came from the Netherlands, as I had mentioned. There were 14 crew members and 235 passengers on board, with 52 of those passengers being children. After the aircraft landed at Tenerife, the passengers went to the airport terminal. Now with Pan Am Flight 1736, the flight came from JFK International Airport. There were 380 passengers on board, with most of them being people who are of retirement age. So why were these flights diverted? Well, at quarter past 1 p.m., a bomb exploded at the terminal of Grand Canaria Airport, and as a result, the airport was temporarily closed, and all incoming flights were diverted to Tenerife, a.k.a. Los Rodeos Airport. The crew of Pan Am decided to be in a holding pattern until they were given clearance to land at Grand Canaria Airport. However, they were diverted to Tenerife. This airport, Los Rodeos Airport, is a very small airport with having one runway and one taxiway. The taxiway was running parallel to the runway. Diverted aeroplanes had to park on the, the long taxiway and this meant that that taxiway was unavailable for other aircrafts to taxi. So aircrafts that were waiting to take off needed to taxi onto the runway, then position themselves to take off, aka back taxi. The situation is incredibly dangerous because 
There were no technological equipment that could track where each plane was. They just relied on word of mouth which is crazy if you think about it. After some time, authorities reopened Grand Canaria Airport and as a result, Pan Am wanted to take off, but they couldn't because KLM Flight 405 and a refueling vehicle was in the way. The distance between the two planes at this point was 3,7 meters or 12 feet, which is very small. The refueling took approximately 35 minutes, which delayed Pan Am Flight 1736's takeoff. After refueling, the air traffic controller told KLM Flight 4805 to taxi down the runway and make a 180-degree turn to get into takeoff position. Pan Am was instructed to follow KLM Flight 4805 down the same runway, exit by taking the third exit on the left, then use the parallel taxiway. The crew of Pan Am Flight 1736 were confused on whether or not the air traffic controller said the, to take the first or the third exit. So they asked for clarification and the air traffic controller said the third one, sir. One, two, three, third, third, one. So the crew started taxiing on the runway looking for the sign that indicated the third taxiway. By they, I mean Pan Am Flight 1736. The Pan Am crew identified taxiway C1 and C2 or Charlie 1 and Charlie 2, but they couldn't see the third one. The visibility at this point was horrible, so they couldn't see the signage properly. The angle of the third taxiway was 148 degrees, which meant that they had to turn 148 degrees. Imagine trying to turn a whole airplane 148 degrees. That's so crazy. After they turned, they had to continue taxiing towards the start of the runway. There wasn't any clear communication. This is crazy. After lining up, Captain Van Santen of KLM increased the speed in order to take off, regardless of the fact that they didn't get any clearance from air traffic control, which is dangerous as hell if you think about it. Captain Van Santen responded by saying, Nope, I know that. Go ahead, ask. When First Officer Mills basically told, the captain that hey we can't take off and Mears told the air traffic controller that they were quote-unquote ready for takeoff and waiting for our air traffic control clearance the air traffic controller got back to them and told them that the route they were supposed to use after they've taken off even though the word take off was used it didn't necessarily mean that they could take off they said we are now at take off then the captain said we are going then the KLM crew was getting up to go, but the controller couldn't see the airplanes due to the fog. So the air traffic controller just said, okay. In my opinion, when I'm reading this, I feel like the air traffic controller was acknowledging that KLM Flight 4805 was at takeoff, not that they were supposed to take off. The crew may have taken it as we can take off. Now I can realize how confusing that may be especially if you're not a native English speaker. As also me when I read about this it was confusing for me too because I'm also not an English speaker but anyway at the same time in the Pan Am aircraft they were lost like incredibly lost they missed their taxiway and they were trying to get back to it they were dealing with a lot and they had communication saying we are still taxiing down the runway the clipper 1736 open m 1736 i feel so bad for these people because you can actually hear that they were lost as hell it's crazy however the craziest part is as they were communicating with the traffic controller a three second sound just occurred which meant that the air traffic controller's messages and their messages to the air traffic controller didn't go through. Why they didn't repeat it to each other, we'll never know. To make matters worse, they couldn't see each other due to the fog, so this was honestly a disaster waiting to happen. So KLM Flight 4805 started its takeoff role. The air traffic controller told the crew of Pan Am to quote unquote report when runway clear. Pan Am Flight 1736 acknowledged this. The KLM crew could hear this transmission and as a result the flight engineer said, and I quote, is he not clear that Pan American? Then the captain said, oh yes, then still continued with the takeoff role. It's crazy to hear a pilot say this, 
especially the captain all of this is insane all of this is crazy so pan am flight 1736 as i had mentioned they were incredibly lost and they were still trying to find their taxiway poor them honestly uh, as klm was getting closer captain grabs realized that they were coming because then they could see that the klm aircraft was starting it was taking off it, <laughs> this is crazy and captain grab said god damn that son of a bee is coming so then the captain captain grabs increased the throttle and tried to make a left turn to get out of the way at the same time the klm crew finally saw pan am flight 1736 but it was too late for them to stop so then the crew of klm rotated their nose of their aircraft to try and lift off at 140 knots 260 kilometers or 160 miles per hour but this caused a hail strike about 22 meters or 72 feet long then the klm's nose landing gear didn't hit the pan am aircraft but everything else did this led to the pan am aircraft ripping in half the klm jet was still airborne for a little bit before going into a stall rolling sharply and hitting the ground it had a lot of fuel since i had mentioned they refueled for about 35 minutes and therefore when it fell it caused a fireball unfortunately every single person on the klm aircraft died and 335 people on the pan am aircraft had passed away and i know that when i do these episodes it kind of feels like yeah you know 300 people is not a lot when you think about it but when you actually actually think about it you start to think that if 10 people are a lot of people imagine 300 plus people all of this is crazy and remarkably 61 people survived including the crew of Pan Am Flight 1736. After the collision, the Pan Am crew tried to switch off their engines and all their things, but their controls weren't working, so they couldn't shut their engines down. Nothing else happened, luckily. So with the investigation, the CIAIAC, I'm not going to butcher that, of Spain, was investigating the collision representatives of the united states the netherlands and two airline companies joined them in order to figure out why this thing actually happened so to start off they decided to go through the fdr or the flight data recorder and the investigators immediately dismissed the idea of mechanical error because the data didn't show any mechanical error so let's look at the weather so at los radios airport the airport itself is 633 meters or 2077 feet above sea level there were high density clouds on that day and they were 600 meters or 2000 feet which meant that they were at ground level of los radios airport when pan am flight 1736 started taxiing their visibility fell to 500 meters or 1600 feet and when they turned on to the runway it reduced further to less than 100 meters or 330 feet the klm flight visibility was basically the same thing if not worse now let's talk about the cockpit voice recorders so when the investigators started listening to these recordings they started to realize that the most important information wasn't being heard by the people who needed to hear it the air traffic controller was occupied as he or she was controlling many aircrafts at one time with no help and pan am flight 1736 they were lost and confused as to where they were supposed to go all of this together is very scary and automatically they knew what caused this collision so leading up to the collision there were language barriers between the air traffic controller and klm i do agree with this because also me as like a person who had to learn how to speak english 
around the ages of like 10, 11, 12. Like, I get it how there is a language barrier, especially when I am talking to people who are native English. Now, imagine if I'm trying to communicate with a person who is a native English speaker during a high or like a stressful situation like this. It's insane. It's crazy. All of this led to the confusion. Captain Van Santen was stressed and wanted to take off ASAP. And honestly, I didn't understand why until found out that the duty times at KLM are incredibly strict. And that is why he wanted to take off as soon as possible. And also, we know that whole thing of pilots needing to be on time because connecting flights, some flights starting, they need to be there, that type of thing. In my opinion, he was being too harsh and he could have just waited a little bit. But then also I could see why he was pushing so hard to get off the ground. Then the Pan Am crew, I don't know why I feel so bad for them. Because they didn't like truly, they tried, but they didn't understand the taxi instructions that they were given by the ground controller and the air traffic controller. I don't know why but i feel so bad for them imagine you trying to find something and you just can't find it i feel so 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 bad for them then the klm crew jumped to the gun when the first officer said we are now at takeoff and the air traffic controller said okay i think this goes back to the language barrier that i was talking about before then the Pan Am crew passed the taxiway and didn't hear the clearance that was given to KLM as they were trying to solve the problem that they were having. The interruption, the three second interruption, prevented both planes from obtaining critical information. I think also what I have to add here as my own opinion is the air traffic controller like i get that the airport was busy imagine trying to deal with for example three airplanes five airplanes at once i get that truly get that but i think as an air traffic controller as much as you probably not used to how things are going when it's like a stressful situation but i honestly think as an air traffic controller yes you're going to have like your mini slip ups maybe for the first hour but then after that you're going to take control and then you're going to maybe get help and then you're going to steer the ship accordingly as much as the final report did kind of put the fact that the air traffic controller was busy and that led to the collision I think that we need to emphasize the fact that this person, this person, honestly, I don't want to say that they weren't doing their job, but they weren't really as efficient as they were supposed to be. I, I don't know. I don't know. Let me know what you think, but that's just my opinion. So the recommendations were that number one, they need to introduce standard terminology that will not confuse anyone. For example, the word takeoff should not be used in an air traffic controller clearance. Number two, the ground radar needs to be installed, which you have seen now at airports, it has already been installed. Number three, taxiing is barred when visibility is below 150 meters unless there is proper lighting. Each crew member needs to research what their role is during flights to avoid confusion, fights, and or human error. And that is why I said before that the air traffic controller, if you're looking at this from a scale of one to uh, 100, we need to at least like put the blame on the air traffic controller, at least like 20%, because honestly, I feel like that air traffic controller should have heard um, the maybe the accent of how these people are talking and then realize that oh these people may have a language barrier let me ask do you really like do you speak english that often yes or no if no then you're going to simplify what you're saying right i don't know but that's how i would operate this i don't know i'm not a pilot but honestly
I don't know why, but I have so many thoughts when it comes to this collision. The second thing that we truly need to talk about is how strict airlines are. Is how strict airports are. Like, I get the fact that you need to be on time for different flights, connecting flights, that type of thing. But also, I feel like you should give at least a two-hour window so that if flights are late, then the pilot could maybe then go into another aeroplane then fly that aeroplane somewhere else hopefully you know what i'm saying there should be like at least a little bit of window that will allow pilots to actually like refresh a little bit then get back into it then it will also be beneficial for the passengers to be like okay i won't miss my connecting flight because after an hour after two hours the pilots will be here and then we'll start boarding that's just me that's just me though Oh yes, and one thing, I don't know if it was mentioned on the recommendations, but I think for me, one thing would definitely have to be, I saw or I heard, I don't remember where I saw or heard this, um, that the signages there by the airport, by Los Rodeos Airport, they weren't really clear or they weren't there, and that's why Pan Am honestly was lost and they didn't know where they were supposed to go and i feel like they should put like better signs i feel like they did that honestly if they did yes as long as that they maintain the quality of the signs then i'm good but i know for some airports they don't really care or they don't have the resources or there's like political stuff you know corruption economic stuff the vibes but as long as for me they are maintained we'll never see a disaster like this ever again anyway uh thank you so much for listening this has been like a more laxed episode if you can tell um yeah uh just to finalize i know that spotify rapped was like the day before yesterday like last week or something and i just have to say i've been seeing the support that you guys have about this podcast and i say thank you so much i love to see how there are so many people who listen to this podcast and i'm actually part of their top 10 top 5 number one podcast that makes my day thank you so much honestly don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you are listening on any podcast listening platform, don't forget to rate the podcast. I don't know how many stars you think that this podcast deserves. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. See you next week, hopefully.